I'd like to open uh, the book club session and um, with the Changi Cross. I mean, the Changi Cross, um, I first met Bernard uh, in the FIPA community, and uh, Bernard has been with us a long time. We all know Bernard. Oh, yeah. And Louise, we should have met in Great Yarmouth, Louise. But we never did because yeah, I'd, I'd, I did my Achilles, didn't I? So I, had, well, I was in a boot. Uh, but um, Louise, would you like to start yeah. and, and say a piece about really, the Shaggy Cross? Yeah. Is, is Bernard online? I can't see his photo. Yeah, he's here. Is he? OK. Um, well, he was um, after I published Down to Bear Drop, which is my dad's diaries, I then realised that I had a story to tell which involved myself. So that was in 2014. Um, it was about the Changi Cross, which my father had brought home, a small brass altar cross about 18 inches high. And he used it on the altars of the four little chapels he made when he was a prisoner, both in Changi and then up country at Kanchanaburi. Um, and after he died, my mum put it in the spare room. Um, we didn't really know what to do with it, um, but we heard there was a museum in Changi, so my mum, said to me and my brother, could I go out and donate it to them? So we did that in 1992. But then I began some research into its background, and I realised that the cross had touched a lot of men's lives. And um, Bernard, I know you're there. Out of the blue, one day I got a phone call from a man in Pontypris who said his father was the prisoner who crafted it out of an old howitzer shell case. So Bernard, um, I know your father, tragically, Harry Stogden, didn't come home, but I wonder if you'd like to take over at this point about how you discovered about the cross. Now, Bernard is on, but he might be having trouble with his computer. OK, well, in, in that case, in that case, I'll just finish what I was going to say about the book and then he can join us when he can, because for him, the cross was the only link he had with the father he was born before the war, a father he didn't know. So Bernard went out to Singapore and held the cross in his hands. And he said, this is so touching. I felt that my father had held it and he'd made it and I was walking in his footsteps. Everywhere I went, my father was being there. It was a very moving time. And it was so important for Bernard and we've become good friends. And I'm hoping he'll come on and talk about it in a minute. But I also wanted to say that I traced the man called Tim Hemmings who engraved the cross with the badges of the regiments in the parishes, my father's parish there. Um, he worked on the death railway, driving in the spikes. And um, I've got a picture of him holding the railway spike in his hand. But would you believe it? He died just last Tuesday. I yep. think it's really timely we're talking about him today. He died peacefully in Bexhill um, in, in a care home with his family around him. He was a really gracious man. I met him quite a lot. He'd been up by the railway. He talked about how awful conditions were, but um, he survived and he came home intact, as it were. And he then be he became a stonemason and um, finally worked on the angels on the Canterbury Cathedral, on the front of Canterbury Cathedral. So that's how, that's what's in the book. Um, and actually, I'm really pleased because it's still, it's on sale at the Changi Museum and I turn, intend for it to be kept there so that visitors can always pick it up who know nothing about the POWs, and then they can read this story. So over to you, Barbara, now. Oh, OK. <laughs> right, well, I, I got your book um, at uh, the conference in Liverpool um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. I think it was quite hot off the press at that time. It was, um, yes. Yeah, and um, it, it's a fascinating story. My own father left uh, Singapore in April and went out mm -hmm. to Saigon. So I, I had no knowledge of this. I visited Changi um, in about, 19, about 1999, something like that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of fascinating to come back and years later, find out more of what's happened. So it, it is a fascinating story. One thing I wanted to ask is that um, I, I just wondered whether Jack Chaplin was still alive, because no, I think he's... No. OK. Yes. He it, it just very involved. No, well done. But he was very involved. He lived in um, Suffolk, <laughs> very involved in tracing all the stuff from St George's, the converted mosque, which my dad used as a church. 
and he was in touch with my mother. Um, this would have been around 1992, early 90s, but he's definitely gone now. He was, he was an old man then. It just tied in with man. things that we've been discussing about how many of the FIPOs are left. Did, did, I, did you know him? Did you no, know I, him? I didn't know him. Just, it's, yeah. it's just relevant to something that we've been trying to sort of perhaps um, establish yes. how many of our FIPOs are still alive. Okay, I, right. I, I asked um, Ron Mockford, who is part of our, our group, uh, he was captured in Java, so March is sort of very relevant to him. And then he was eventually, via other places, came and was a, a prisoner in Changi. But he had no recollection of any of the St George's chapels or anything like that. So after meeting with him, I came home, reread the book, and mm. then on that day heard, sadly, about the death of Tim. Um, perhaps mm. at the end of the meeting, we can have a minute's silence um, in recognition of Tim's passing. Um, my husband said it was my fault that we lost Tim because I'd reread the book that day. I don't think you know, it's coincidence, oh. isn't it? Um, no. But it is a fascinating story. And having seen Bernard on these meetings, I felt it was a big tribute to his father that we started the book club by going Absolutely. through this book. Mm. Your, father's, mm. your father's story is a fascinating one as well. Um, and I think he held a lot of the men together uh, psychologically by having been able to establish the chapels. The fact that it had been a mosque um, and that, you know, um, they were welcomed to use the mosque by one of the uh, Muslims that came there to see them. It is just yeah. an amazing story. And I think a lot of our FIPOs managed to survive yeah. by having these uh, meetings in these chapels. These, and, that, and especially when your father went up um, up the railway to Kanchanaburi, yes, yeah. you know, that they were able to do it there. How many of them kept their faith afterwards, I don't know, but it saw a lot of our men through, that strength, yes. that unity. Yes. Um, well, he, he said, he said um, initially in Changi, people were really homesick, and to go to that little church made them, reminded them of home. I mean, he was well aware of that. We got, Thank you. we did get a lot of feedback. Louise, I'm just mentioning that you, we lost your sound. Yes, so, I, I, it froze. It froze. Here. Yeah. Yes. So I, I just, I just yeah. stepped in. That the, the, the email you sent me, I did put on yes. Facebook, and there's at the moment twenty, uh, forty-one replies. Isn't that lovely? Uh, a lot of them rest in peace, and a lot of good yeah. things about Tim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he did. Uh, what I understand, he did uh, engrave the the cross with. Uh, can you the, tre the trefoils on the cross, the edge, he engraved yeah. them with the um, badges of the regiments, which were in the sort of parish. Um, yeah. I've, he, actually, his children have got my father's drawings of the trefoils to which he worked. It's amazing. Yeah. Are you there, Bernard? Do you know Ron? Ah, oh, oh, brilliant, brilliant, Bernard. <laughs> We've got you, mate. I want my tablet now. She can. Right, Bernard. Tell us how you met Louise. Um, it was on a Saturday evening that we'd had post uh, in the morning, and I hadn't opened it. And uh, my wife brought the post in to me to to um, read in the evening. And the first letter that I had was a sort of a FIPO newsletter. And there was a story about the Changi Cross on it. And they said that it was made by a staff sergeant in the RAOC. And they wanted to know uh, where it was. Hmm. So I read and read the story. And the, the, the words were jumping out of the page because it said that it only had the soldier's first name, Harry, and the mob that he was in. So. I showed my wife and she said, what do you think of that? And I said, that's my father. And she said, no. I said, yes, it is. That's my father. So I rang the man. He lived in Leon C. And introduced myself. And he said, I'm ever so pleased that you rang. He said, because it is your father. And he was my friend. And I watched him make that cross. So that then... I searched then and I found Louise and uh, I rang 
her. She wasn't at home, but her brother will answer the phone. And she said, you need to speak to my sister, Louise. She's not at home at the moment, but she will be here this evening. So I don't know whether I rang you, Louise, or you rang me. I think you rang me. Yeah. 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 yeah, a nice old chat, yes. <laughs> and then we... I, I came to your home for a, for a Sunday dinner. You did, and yeah. Ron, yeah. <laughs> oh. do I look beautiful now? You look <laughs> absolutely fantastic, Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> right, go on, Bernard. You were saying that you found Louise. Yes, and, and uh, we had a meeting. And um, well, that, that was years ago, wasn't it, Louise? Oh, years ago, Bernard. 2014. Louise comes yes. to see me every year. And um, Louise had the idea then of writing the book. Mm. Yes. Well, I had a lot of the pictures, which Louise didn't know about. I had no. pictures of her. And uh, I sent them to her. And um, I can remember uh, um, Paul, Louise's husband, rang me and yes. he said, about the, uh, the one photograph, he said, could I uh, email it to him? So I did. And then within five minutes, uh, I had this phone call and the man shouted down, it's him, it's him. Yes. And I said, him. <laughs> and he said, that's my father. It's it's father. And I, I had all these photographs in my father's belongings. Strange, wasn't it? Mm. So those are the photos. I don't know if you can see them. Yep. But the thing is that Bernard's father, Harry, took those photos of my dad because they were so proud of the cross. Yes, right. Thought. Yeah, so proud of the cross right. they made. Yeah. And Louise, you uh, your dad, can we call him Eric? Of course you can call him Eric. Of course yeah. you can. Er Eric took the Eric cross Paul, yes. up the railway. You hear that, Louise? Sorry, it's, Eric. I Eric can't, it's took breaking. the cross up the railway. Yeah. Oh Can yes, he did. Yeah. 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 And when, when he got when he was in Canterbury, of course, it was horrific conditions there. There were hospitals, but he finally made a little chapel, or the prisoners did, and put the cross in the chapel there. It, it de definitely gave the POWs a lot of hope. Mm-hmm. And, and when I went out to um, Ch Kanchanaburi, the, sorry, um, Chang in the museum recently, the, the cross was all tarnished, it looked rather green. And I said, you've got to polish it because that's what the prisoners saw. They saw a shining brass cross, mm -hmm. which for them was a sign of hope. No way would they let it be tarnished. So they've agreed they'll keep it polished now. It's really important, I think, because it was a sort of symbol of hope. Yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't have many many lovely things, but at least the lovely things they had, they could take care of. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do we? My, dad, my dad did say that um, <clears throat> he. My dad wasn't religious. No. Uh, no. But uh, but he 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 said that the religion gave a lot of the POWs hope. Yeah. But Bob Bob Hucklesby, he's not religious either, but he said. Um, in the war, faith had a purpose, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. 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 But faith to make it home. Yeah. Yeah. Faith to feel there's something around that they're not just, you know, um, victims of the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Bernard, later on, Bernard, you did get in touch with somebody who lived very close to you. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I, I, I put a story in the, uh, well, not a, in the newspaper. It was a South Wales newspaper. And uh, when it came out on a Saturday morning, the phone was nonstop. People ringing. And, and but the first phone call that I had was from a, a North Walesian. Uh, man by the name of John Roberts and he said did you put this story in the newspaper and I said yes I did and he said um, 
I want you to promise me right now. He said, I don't know you, but I want you to promise me that you'll come and stay with me in Singapore. I live and work in Singapore. I know about the cross, and uh, I'd like you to come and stay with us so that you can go and see it, which we did. I think we went the, the following, uh, yes, yeah, I'm trying to think what year it was. Anyway, uh, we did go. We had a lovely time. Uh, I was introduced to the, the um, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of the, 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 the um, uh, British High Commissioner. And I, I had breakfast with him. It was all, all so, so very important sort of thing. I, I, just, I felt I was like royalty. <laughs> but, uh, yes. And then I met the uh, Singapore uh, head of state, and uh, we mm. we had and I was I was made to sit next to him, and um, it was lovely. This we was all before. The, this was all before you saw the cross. Um, no, it was it was I, I had a second invitation to go. The Singapore Tourist Board invited me to go out. They built a new museum at a cost of $3 million. And uh, I went and I, I was guest of honor at the opening. And I placed the, the cross where it is today. And I don't know whether it is there today. because they, And I placed it on the altar. Explain, it, explain uh, Bernard, explain your feelings when you actually saw the cross for the first time. Yet I couldn't keep my eyes dry, and when I held it, you know, and I, uh, I examined uh, how my father had made it, and uh, looked at the back, and it all soldered together, and I thought, well, I don't know how to do it, because they they had very little, did they? You know, but you, uh, you, yeah, you told me that was made out of a bombshell. Yes, it made out of a, a four point five. Yes. Yeah. He'd cut it down, he'd, he'd cut the base off, and then he'd cut the base in half, and then he'd, he'd cut the uh, strips uh, for, the, for the cross itself out of the shell. Well, I, was, I wouldn't know if they'd done that, Ron, I don't know. But they, they would only have had a hacksaw, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. uh, he did a good job. Yes. Was, you, was uh, your father, can, can you remember if your father was religious before he went out there? No, I, I know very little about my father. Um, I can't ever, I mean, I was only four year old. I can't ever remember um, seeing him. But I must have, obviously. But um, no, I got no memories of that at all. But then no. later on, you did get um, in touch with somebody who was actually on the ship when your dad, where your dad was buried. Yes, and, and, and this was a man. He was he was um, he was living quite local. He, he was living, I'd say, about ten miles away. And uh, he had read the story in the newspaper, and he said, um, he said, I buried your father. He said. At sea, and I said, "Did you?" Yes, he said. I was twenty-one year old, and I was a ship's petty officer on HMS Speaker. And he said, uh, "Your father's body was transferred to our ship from off the American hospital ship, which was the USS Avon." And he said, "We sailed out to free waters, and we buried your father in the sea at Nagasaki." You know, and he had a um, he had a, an album, and it was full of the pictures of the ship. How when the war ended and they were bringing the prisoners back, that they they threw all all the airplanes because it was an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. They threw all the airplanes in the sea. Yep. To put the the, the prisoners up. And I, 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 uh, just a minute, Bernard. Have you? Ah, oh, there's the boogler. Ah, oh, the boogler, Bernard. We've got it in the book now. Tell I, us about I, the boogler. 
invited to go to a ship's reunion at Birmingham. And uh, I met a lot of the the old um, ship's crew there. And uh, the one man came up to me and he said, um, you got the picture of, of your father's burial at sea? And I said, yes, I got that. I said, I can see my father's body. That's right. And he said, um, I was the I was a ship's bugler. And he said, I was the one that was uh, giving tribute to your father. That's the man there. That's the man. And um, he said, that's how I was there. He said, I, I belonged to the Salvation Army. Sorry to interrupt. You first saw the cross in 1998 when you traveled to Singapore. And yes. according, to the book, according to the book, you were invited back on the 15th of February, 2001. Yes, so that's there's right. Your there's, there's your timeline. Uh, right, yeah, Louise. Well, yeah. Right. Th thanks, Bernard. That's that's a great story. That's that's really good. Would you Hello, like to? Sorry. Would you sorry. like to? Yes. Would you like to say anything more? Um, it's just that the story was magical. I did. I mean, I didn't really have to write it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a brilliant picture. Um, yeah. So the book the book does I mean a lot, know. Bernard. You see my father's body there on the on the ship. Yep. Yeah. And the Bernard, the Bernard, part? the book to you does mean a lot. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So that, do anyone else want to ask questions? I'm telling you. I'd, I'd just Any like questions? to say to Bernard how sad it was that um, his dad unfortunately succumbed to the berry berry, which had affected so many of our, our men out there. And how sad it was that um, having you know, survived all those years of captivity, that once he was in freedom, that the Berry Berry mm -hmm. sadly you know, ended his life when he was literally on his way home. How devastating. Can I, can I, I think she's gone on to mute, but I, I think that the artwork that um, Louise was lucky enough to have for the book really creates the atmosphere. The, the pictures by Eric Stacey and, and Des Bettany you know, they really bring, you know, you can almost feel the atmosphere of it there and it illustrates it really well. Better than sort of photographs, because oh, those yeah. are the men putting, you know, those two men putting their actual feelings into those, those paintings that they did. And, and I think it um, illustrates the book, book absolutely beautifully, you know, that it was done at the time. You know, so, yeah, thank you for using those, Louise. I think they, they make the book, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. If yeah, you can enjoy was, a book um, about that. Your other book, Down to Bedrock. Yes. Yes. What about it? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, that was it. That was the other yeah. one. That's right. Yeah. Basically, that is your father, father's journey it's, through the war. Yeah, it's, it's his actual diary written down. So we just put it together. But um, Barbara, I just want to thank Barbara for being so kind about all this. It's really kind of you, Barbara. Okay. Um, I, I think the book is a tribute. To well, to the men in Changi, and to your father who helped well, help them get yes. through it. Really, thank you, thank you, Barbara. And also the fact that we had so much original art, as you said, makes it brings it to life, doesn't it? Yeah. It certainly does. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much.